I'm delighted that you could join me. Welcome to Sewing with Nancy. This program is the first part of a three-part series entitled Fleece in a Flash. As you might guess, I'll be sharing with you fleece projects that are effortless to sew yet have great appeal. I'd like to begin by creating plush pillowcases. These easy sew pillowcases showcase basic fleece sewing techniques while sporting great style. The plush texture of high loft fleece combined with their easy care characteristics make them perfect pillow covers. That's what's next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, TV's how-to sewing program with Nancy Zeman is brought to you by Pfaff, the largest European producer of sewing machines. Pfaff's creative line of sewing machines and hobby lock sergers are simply the best. Ginger, a tradition of quality scissors and shears for home, classroom, and industry. Ginger scissors and shears are the choice of professionals. Madeira, superior quality threads from Germany, specializing in embroidery, quilting, and special effects threads, because creativity is never black and white. Prim Dritz, the source for sewing and quilting notions, including products by Dritz, Collins, and OmniGrid. Amazing designs by Great Notions, your one source for home embroidery. Over 200 disc pack collections currently available, including designs by Nancy Zeman. Koala cabinets from Australia, quality crafted, fully assembled sewing furniture, designed for maximum storage in minimum space. And Nancy's Notions catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and unique hard to find sewing notions and supplies. You can create two plush pillowcases from a yard and a fourth of fleece fabric. And you'll be going to cut two panels, each 22 inches wide. And you can add accents to the top flap or the cuff as we have here, or you can just have them plain with button and buttonholes, or you can add stretch binding. I'll show you how to do all the above. We have the panel cut 22 by 60. Here's the length of the fabric. And then on each short end, press under, finger press under one inch as we have pinned in this instance, and then edge stitch from that one inch edge. Top stitch a little less than half of an inch from the fold. So you're going to turn under an inch and top stitch. Simple hemming. Then to do the folding, measure six inches from one fold, measure six inches, and fold meeting right sides. Now remember, to unfleece, give it a tug and it rolls to the wrong side. So fold meeting right sides together at that six inch cuff. That will be the overlap that you just saw. Then measure from the fold 26 inches, and I've already found the 26 inch mark from the fold to 26, and that will be the length of your pillowcase. On the underside, you can see that that flap is a little bit shorter than the top edge, and that's just the way it should be. So the first measurement of six inches, then the second measurement from the fold to 26 to give you your length and then stitch, stitching a presser foot width of a seam on each side. I'm going to be showing you in a few minutes how to finish the hem with stretch binding. This is our finished pillowcase with stretch binding. It's wrong side out. When I turn this right side out, you can see what happens to the flap. It comes to the right side and it makes a wonderful closure for that pillow inside. The pillows cannot slip out of the pillowcases. And with a little magic of turning that fleece, you'll have a pillowcase. The finishing details of the stretch binding, the button and button holes, I'll show you right now. The pillowcase that I just turned right side out was obviously finished. At the point of which you turn it right side out, you would not have buttons or buttonholes in it. And I'd like to show you how to sew the buttonholes and buttons in fleece. Here's the finished pillowcase that has a stretch binding and I'll be showing you that process in just a few minutes but right now let's concentrate on these buttonhole areas. We place three buttonholes quartering the top area. To quarter the top cuff and the, this is the finished pillowcase below I simply would fold the pillowcase in half and pin mark the center and then fold the sides to the center and pin mark again so that you can see the three pin marks marking the position of the buttonholes. Now one layer of fleece is not enough to support the buttonhole width. It would bow out of shape. It would be ugly after a short period of time. We add a little extra stability to the underside of the buttonhole by placing a sticky back fusible interfacing on the wrong side of some fabric. The sticky back fusible fuses or presses to the wrong side of the fleece and then cut that into let's say one by two inch strips of fabric. Peel away the paper. And 
this area is sticky. On a sample, do a test sample, place on the underside the little stabilizer so that you have two weights. Now there's another reason to place it on the fabric. The buttonholes will go in the stretch of the of the fleece, and usually I don't like to recommend this, but it has to happen in this instance. So this definitely has a great amount of stability because of that extra piece of fabric right there. Test buttonhole is very important, and I've already determined how long to make my buttonhole. It needs to be quite long because I'm using large buttons, but just test it just to make sure. And I'll just sew through all of these layers. My little arrow has to end up at the fifth hash mark, so I'll just sew until that point. Then it will go in reverse, and I can cut open the buttonhole to see if I have the right length. And notice I'm not even holding the fabric. That stabilizer on the underside helped me sew that buttonhole properly. So after sewing the buttonhole, then cut it open using a buttonhole cutter and block or your favorite technique. And you can see through both layers that we have the buttonhole. And you'll only see this side, minus the threads, of course, and cut it open and check it out. Simple way to position it. Then after putting on the buttonholes, you'll after you'll need to put in the buttons and the button has the same kind of process you'll need an extra weight underneath the button this sample simply shows that the button has been stitched to through two layers of fabric again using a small square applied with the sticky back stabilizer to the underside and it'll give enough weight to support the button simple as that now we'd like to look again at the finishing touch of the binding this binding would be done early in the process. You would simply cut the length of the pillowcase 22 inches by 58, shorten it by 2 inches, because we want to get rid of the extra hem that you turned under. So shorten it by 2 inches. The stretch binding has lycra in it. It has a lot of stretch, a tremendous amount. We don't need to use that amount of stretch. We just need it on a one-to-one -one basis with the fabric, meeting right sides, pin the stretch binding to the short ends, to the right side of the short ends of your pillowcase. Guide the presser foot down the edge so that you have approximately a 3 8 of inch seam. You don't have to measure here, just use that presser foot width. Then wrap it to the underside and pin. And you would like to pin it so that you have an even width going all the way down. Take a little time in this step to practice. Now, you, if you've never put stretch binding on fleece before, this is a great way to start because you're not putting on a garment, but a home decorating area. I'll simply remove my buttonhole foot and apparatus, and I'm going to put on an edge joining foot. This is the one that came with my machine, or you can many times get them separately. They have a little bar of bar involved in them. They're down the center of the foot, and this bar allows you to stitch right in the ditch. Stitch, guide this little appendage down the seam. Now remember, stitching in the ditch is that crazy term we use with a straight stitch. And simply place the bar of the foot down the adjoining area, and that little appendage will guide right where you should stitch. And it makes the sewing so simple. This is a fast way of putting on the stretch binding. Let me show you what it looks like when you're all finished. When you're finished having the binding on the edge, a very neat hem. On the underside, you could trim away the extra fabric or binding if you'd like to. The option is yours. You noticed on our finished sample that we had some embroidery, machine embroidery, using a computerized sewing machine. We've shown this in the past on Sewing with Nancy quite frequently, but it's worth a review. Place a sticky back stabilizer in the hoop and remove the paper from the area. Place the fleece over the sticky back. It holds it in place, and then you can place your embroidery right on the fleece, positioning it right where you'd like, surrounding the buttonholes. An easy embellishment. Wrap your baby in cozy fleece with a satin binding. Babies in soft, cuddly, high loft fleece just naturally go together. Plus, what toddler doesn't love the feel of satin binding? This fleece project is truly speedy, yet a welcome gift for any new mom and her baby. Here's how to create my version of a satin and fleece blanket. You could really use any type of fabric, but fleece is very appropriate, and using satin binding. The key will be to get the mitered corners very neatly at the four corners of the blanket. 
You can add an applique if you'd like for a little embellishment, but right now we'd really like to concentrate on the satin bind, bound edge of this blanket. You can make a 30 inch square, 45 inch square, or 60 inch square blanket if you'd like. This happens to be a 36 inch square blanket and purchase folded in half two inch binding. The binding is four inches, the satin binding is four inches. It's press marked in half to give a two inch width of binding. We're working with small samples. This would be your large 36 or 45 inch square. But cut the binding four inches longer than the size of your blanket. So if this would be a 36 inch blanket, this binding would be 40 inches. Cut four lengths, four inches longer than the size of your blanket. On the top and lower edge of the blanket, pin the binding around each edge. And we're going to take some of these pins out later, but you're going to kind of anchor it down right now. To mark the positioning of the miter, place the remaining two bindings not over the edge, but just on top of the blanket so that the folded edge meets the cut edge of the blanket and have the extension on the side. And we're just going to kind of anchor this down, pin it down to do some measuring and marking. After pinning this down, the two key areas will be to mark the inner corner or the outer corner and the inner corner. And I'll just, with the tip of my pen, marking pen, mark the point at which the two bindings meet at the outer edge and then as well as at the inner edge. And I'm going to fold this under so that I get both layers of fabric. You may want to then stick a pin through the fabric so that you can mark the opposite side where the binding meets. Then gently unpin some of the pins and meet right sides together and align the marks. On this next sample I've slightly darkened these marks for you so that you can see the three points to form the miter, the inverted miter, are marked on this binding. With a straight edge line up your ruler and the three marks and I'm doing this in midair, you could do this lying on the table, mark a stitching line and this will be in a 45 degree angle. Follow the blue line and stitch from one point to the peak and then back down again. After the stitching, tr trim the seam allowances down to about a fourth of an inch. Now you can next with the satin binding, you, you don't want to use steam on satin, so a dry iron will work best and I'm going to start by finger pressing the seam open, then using your iron, or I'm going to use a smaller pressing tool press open the seam allowances. That's why you need to finger press first. Here we go. And then press the seam open. We'll get it. There we go. And press this so it's nice and flat and it does press a little bit better working on a flatter surface. Then simply turn this right side out. And you'll find that the mitered edge will meet the shape of the blanket. After this has been shaped, then wrap it around the edge, mitering all four corners, and zigzag or machine multi-stitch it in place. Here you can see the stitching of the multi-step stitch. And when you're completed with one step of stitching, the blanket binding is on your blanket. Stitch this cuddly throw in no time using an easy two-layer technique. High law fleece is the batting and backing, and a whimsical cotton flannel print is the top. The only difficult part is deciding who gets to snuggle under this cozy throw. We're going to make this throw a rectangular size, and you'll need a yard and a fourth of the fleece, which is 60 inches wide, and a yard and five-eighths of a cotton flannel print. Pre-wash the cotton flannel because that you might have some shrinkage. You will not have any shrinkage at all on the fleece. You can see that the backing comes around to form the binding. We have mitered corners and on the flip side you'll be able to see the channel stitching, the straight stitching to hold the layers together. This print was ideal since it had linear marks so we didn't have to do a lot of marking. But if your print did not have linear marks like the one I have underneath, I'll show you how to transfer markings to the top so that you can do that channel stitching. After pre-washing your fabric of the flannel, cut the flannel to 56 by 43. 56 by 43. The fleece will be slightly larger by 2 inches, 58 by 45, and center the fleece 
excuse me, slanted the flannel on top of the fleece with one inch extensions all the way around. We have pins about every four inches or so holding the two layers together. This is a great project to do with a friend. Since we do not have lines to mark the channeling, I have pin marks every four inches along the top edge and along the lower edge and get a plumb line of some sort and I'm going to try to do this solo and place the plumb line on the fabric, place the string down and then snap it and I should have a nice stitching line mark. Move it over to the next four inch mark and I have plenty of chalk on here, probably a little bit too much, bring it over and snap it and now I'll know exactly where to do the marking. I think I better do that once more. There we go, now I can see that better. After marking, then simply wrap the quilt, wrapping the short ends to the middle and I'll later show you how to do the channel stitching to secure these layers together. For ease of showing you this technique, I'm going to be working with a very small sample of a fleece flannel throw, but the technique will work the same on any larger piece of fabric. We're going to be channel stitching, stitching the two layers together, the flannel and the fleece. The fleece acts as the batting and the backing, starting from the center and then sewing out on both sides. Directional stitching is important here, stitching starting at the mark. I'm just going to back stitch to secure that at each end and then sewing along the edge. I have the dual feet of my machine connected, which is really important to prevent any shifting. If you needed, perhaps you might want to consider a walking foot for this technique. If you would stitch all of the seams in the same direction, you'd have some shifting of the layers of fabric. So to prevent that, again, I'll just quickly lock a stitch or two. Just simply lift the presser foot, flip your quilt around or your throw around, and stitch the other side in the opposite direction. Just simply, it makes sense. It's easiest to do, but it also will prevent the shifting in the layers. And notice how my pin marks, are, or the pins, the safety pins, are between my marks or where I'm going to be channel stitching. Again, I get to the end, I'll lock stitch, Try it once more. There we go, lock stitch, and then I would simply stitch the opposite end going from bottom to top instead of top to bottom. So you can see that's a really simple way, but those techniques are needed for channel stitching. Now when working with the mitered corner, what I'd like to do for this particular blanket is that I don't have to finish this edge because the fleece will not ravel but I'd like to get a perfect miter at each corner. With a one inch binding to get a perfect miter, measure two inches from the corner and place a mark on the inside. Measure another two inches and place a mark on the inside. Using a tape, this is a source tape, place the tape exactly at those two marks, going across the marks. Then meet the right sides together. This is the most critical part of getting these tape ends aligned perfectly and stick them together. You don't need pins this way. And make certain that those fabrics are meeting at this intersection. Use the tape as a stitching guide. And sometimes I just stitch a basting stitch the first time around just to make sure I have it aligned perfectly. After you've stitched, we'll give it a clip to remove the excess seam allowances, angle at the corners, remove the tape. And then we'll invert this. Finger press the seam open and flip it right side out. And I did a good job. I could restitch this right now. You can see how it formed the perfect miter. Finish pinning the one inch binding and top stitch around the edges to complete your quilt throw. To wrap up this first program on fleece in a flash, I'd like to give you some options for top stitching the binding on this throw. A straight stitch is what we showed you earlier, but you could also choose a feather stitch or a multiple zigzag stitch. These are two great options. Here's a hint from Ginger. When you're doing machine embroidery or cut work, it's sometimes a challenge to trim threads and fabric from the hoop fabric. I keep my curved embroidery scissors close by for just those occasions. The curved blade cleanly cuts threads close to my work without cutting my stitching, and the slender blades allow me to cut right next to my straight stitch cut work design. Another terrific use of the curved embroidery scissors is to trim closely to scallop stitching. This is a very versatile scissors. 
Here's a hint from Adira. Adding a layer of stabilizer to the top or bottom of a project is an important step, giving extra stability to the fabric. For most of my projects, I prefer Avalon by Madeira. This water-soluble stabilizer has double the strength of comparable stabilizers. I simply place the Avalon underneath the fabric, giving the fabric some general stability. If working with nap fabrics like fleece or corduroy, to keep the threads from embedding into the nap, place the Avalon on top and underneath the fabric. When finished, just simply tear away the majority of the stabilizer and spritz the rest away. Here's a hint from Pfaff. For the most accurate of top and edge stitching, use Pfaff's ability to change the needle positions. There are a total of 19 positions ranging from far left to far right, plus many more positions in between. I use the needle position option frequently when using the edge stitch foot. The stitching can be positioned just at your preference. I also use the needle position option when top stitching a zipper. I know you'll find many more uses. Fleece in a flash is a topic of our current Sewing with Nancy series. Welcome. High loft fleeces such as polar and Eskimo fleece is the fabric of choice for outer and casual wear because of its warmth without weight and easy care. For those of us who sew, fleece projects and accessories can be made with ease. Take for example our pocket scarf. Less than one yard of fabric and a touch of creativity results in a comfy scarf with muff-like pockets, perfect for football or soccer games or a brisk walk outdoors. Discover the joy of sewing fleece next Next on Sewing with Nancy. The pocket scarf can be made with or without an embellishment. We've used our favorite school insignia on the lower portion of the pockets and this would be one of the first steps we'd work with. But before adding the applique, we better talk about yardage and how to cut the scarf pieces. You'll need two-thirds of a yard of fabric cut into two lengths that will be 12 inches wide by 60 inches long. So two lengths that are 12 by 60. Keep in mind when cutting fleece, it's quite thick. So if you're using a rotary cutter, I would recommend using the large width, the 60 millimeters, so that you can easily cut through all the depth. You're not cutting cottons here, but thick fabrics. Rotary cutter, ruler, mat is a great way of cutting the fleece. We need to create a nice curve to the lower edge of each corner, place a curve shape, mark it, and then cut along the shape. You would cut all layers, getting those nice curves to the corner. You can see a stabilizer. This is just if I'm going to put an applique in the area. And this is a temporary fuse or press-on stabilizer that has been fused to the wrong side of the fleece. For the applique, you may want to make a mirror image of your applique design, trace it onto the paper side of a sticky-backed fusible interfacing. There's this fusible interfacing on this side and paper, and when we remove the paper, it'll be sticky. Perfect for fleece. Since we can't press on fleece, it'll be a press-on applique. You'll see that in a minute. After fusing on the paper or the interfacing to the wrong side of the fleece, cut it out, and then remove the paper side. And I've started to remove it. We'll simply remove the rest of it and position. The nice thing about this is we do not have to add the heat of the iron to apply the applique. And you can reposition it as I'm showing you here to get it in the right spot. A simple straight stitch or a satin stitch, not a very tight width, a relatively long length of a satin stitch to applique the edges in place. And presto, you have made a very quick embellishment onto this scarf. This is optional, of course, but if you'd like to add that, give it a try. Now, for creating the pocket openings, here are the steps. Measure from the corner of the pocket, measure up 4 inches and then at 10 inches. And I have pins at 4 and 10 inches along one lengthwise edge, not both sides, just one side. And clip a fourth of an inch at each point. Place a layer, as I have done on the flip side, a layer of double-sided basting tape and remove that basting tape edge. And then finger press the seam allowance underneath. This will help stabilize the fleece because it's stretchy in this direction. And top stitch. When I lift up the sample, my life is in samples, here you can see that it's been stitched to create the 
the muff-like opening or the pocket opening on this scarf. The two layers are pinned all the way around, meeting the right sides. Starting at the pocket opening, stitch a fourth of an inch seam allowance all the way around, stopping and starting at each pocket opening. Then simply turn this right side out. Take some time to roll with your fingers the seam to the outer edge and then pin so that you can top stitch all the way around. That rolling of the fabric will give you a nice even finish. The last step is to create a top to the pocket, measure 12 inches from the lower edge, and stitch across all layers to secure that pocket. Your pocket scarf is now complete. We call this program Fleece in a Flash because there's a faster way to make this. It's not as finished, but it certainly would work out well. And that is to use, again, two layers of fabric put together. We've used a border print. But rather than meeting the right sides and turning in the seam allowance, we're simply going to meet the fabrics and sew all the edges together at the same time and leaving these edges raw. At the openings for the pocket, we simply leave those unstitched put our hand in the area. After sewing the two edges together, again meeting wrong sides together to finish the edge, you can simply do some pinking of the edges. With the pinking shears, just cut the fabric. This is not going to ravel. This will give it a slightly neater appearance. And the combined work with the simple sewing of meeting, as I mentioned many times, wrong sides together using the same measurements, again creating a 12-inch pocket gives you a faster scarf to create, a great gift, and a great winter warm-up. Some of you may call them stocking hats. Others may say knit caps, while still others may refer to them as toboggans. Whatever you call them, the goal is the same, head coverings to keep you warm. Keeping with our fleece in a flash concept, my next project, a head covering, is simply called a fleece topper. The sewing is streamlined with two pattern pieces and only three sewing steps. For this project, you'll need a fourth of a yard of fleece and about five-eighths of a yard of stretch binding. The optional part, as you saw on the fleece topper, was the embroidery. I'm going to go over the details of working with the construction of this hat. Cut one banding strip that's five inches wide by 24 inches long, five by 24, and then the circle is a seven and a half inch diameter. Cut one of these pieces. You're going to be sewing the band into a tube, joining the short ends just with a narrow seam allowance. Now fold the band in half and then fold it in half again. We're going to do some quarter marking, placing little clips, very small clips, at each fold. The same type of quarter marking is going to be accomplished on the circle, folding the circle in half, folding it in half again, and then I've already clipped it, just, just a little clip will go a long way at each fold. Meeting right sides, and remember, sometimes it's hard to tell the right from the wrong side. It rolls to the wrong side. Meet the clip marks and pin. Initially, you might think placing a circle to, to meet a straight edge will be difficult sewing. It might be perhaps if this were, would be a cotton fabric or a woven fabric, but being a knit, this simply, the knit stretches to meet the fabrics together, and it goes together easily. Meet those four quarter marks and then sew, sewing on the circle side. Then you can ease in that lower band to meet the circle. The sewing has been accomplished on this piece, easy to put together. Then turn right side out. At this point, don't do any pressing, really at any point, just finger press to get the seams flattened. And now we're going to work with the stretch binding. Stretch binding has a lot of lycra in it. Cut the binding about one inch smaller than your head circumference generally. 22 inch length will work out very well. When working with the binding, sew it into a circle using again the small seam allowance and then pin marks. Don't clip the binding, it will ravel. Place pin marks at each quarter. Then meet the pin marks and the clips on the fleece hat together and I'll just start to meet it. Now the binding will be smaller than the outer edge and you're going to stretch the binding to meet the outer edge. Sew around the edge of the binding and here you can see how it's been stitched. Simple sewing. Then wrap again the binding to finger pressing to the wrong side and pin 
stitch in the ditch, stitching in the well of the seam. We did this in our first program. I've stitched between those two seams. If you'd like, you can trim away this extra fabric. And with about 20 minutes of time, you can create or completely construct a fleece topper. Add some accents if you'd like, and it's perfect for winter wear. I love to make snowmen, especially when the snowfall produces packing snow, snow with just the right consistency to easily roll snowballs. Yet, I can remember pulling off my kids' mittens to find snow collecting between their mittens and sleeves. Now fleece can come to the rescue with extended, too tall mittens. I'll show you how to easily create a pair of mittens that are tall and are just ready for the next snowfall. How many of you have mismatched mittens at your house or gloves? Well, this is a great way of creating a pattern from one of those mismatched mittens. We have some tissue paper that has been folded in half, and along the fold, I outlined a shape of a mitten, or you could simply outline the shape of a hand. But rather than having it the traditional shape, make the mittens too tall, extending the length forward possibly to six inches longer than needed or traditionally made. Add a fourth of an inch seam allowance along the edge and notice that the straight edge of the hand or the mitten is along the fold of the tissue paper. After adding the extension and the seam allowance, then cut out your pattern piece so that you have a double sided portion to the mitten, cutting two layers of fabric. After you cut out the fabric, you'll find or double check that the greatest amount of stretch is the cross portion of the, of the mitten area. And we're going to do some stitching in the cuff to create a ribbing effect. Not actually sewing a ribbing, but using a double needle. Now a double needle has a shaft with two needles on it. Use a size 3.0 or a 4.0 double needle to create ribbing. The, remember the number refers to the distance, this is a 4.0, between the two needles. Use two threads at the top, threading, treating the threads as one until they get to the needles, and then separate the threads to one to each needle. I've slightly loosened the top tension from a five to four or maybe one notch depending upon your machine. And then I'm going to do two types of stitching. First of all, a horizontal stitching and then vertical stitches for ribbing. The horizontal stitching is right below the wrist area and I do this first of all. And I've already accomplished this on this pattern, just stitching across that wrist area. Now I'm going to stitch the, the rib section even on my vest, we have kind of ribbing on the collar just as a decorative effect. Well, you can do this for decoration as well as for a little extra give or stretch in the cuff. We're going to start to sew on an anchor cloth, a little scrap of fabric. And this works out well to sew in this area, to sew on an anchor cloth, because you're sewing just on one layer a bulky fleece. And sometimes if you start to sew at the very edge, the fleece will go down into the feed dog area of your machine. I'm starting to sew at 5 eighths of an inch from the edge and I'm going to stop stitching right at that horizontal first row stitching. Raise the presser bar, gently turn the fabric and then try to restitch in that horizontal row stitching four to five stitches. Let the needle stop in the raised position, twist the fabric and then again start to restitch in the horizontal row and sew it down. And we're simply just adding some ribbing texture. And sew right into that anchor cloth. I'll cut that off in just a few minutes. Raise the presser bar, turn the stitching around, start sewing again in that anchor cloth, and sew another row and you get the idea. Very simple sewing. And I'll do one more turn. And this is not fancy sewing, so you don't have to get perfectly mitered corners. You just want to create some ribbing. With matching thread, it'll work great. After you've sewn all the ribbing techniques, then just trim off the extra little anchor cloth, just clip it off, and then put the ribbing or the mittens together. Meeting right sides, match the side seam. And I've pinned and already stitched, matching that horizontal line, and stitched all the way around the mitten. I'd recommend that you would re-stitch in the mitten area, or the thumb area, and then clip to the stitching line without clipping the stitches. When you turn this right side out, your mitten, after you put on the buttons, will look somewhat like this. And we just would like you to finish the edge just by finishing the lower edge by turning under a fourth of an inch and half an inch, whatever you'd like, and top stitching it into place. 
in a matter of a half an hour, you can create a pair of mittens that are long, great for a snowfall, great for a cold day, and you can always have mittens that match. Keeping with our outerwear theme, next, a self-tying scarf. This comfy scarf requires no knotting or fasteners of any kind, making it less bulky. Best of all, it always stays tied. If you're wondering how this scarf is tied, I'd first of all like to show you the construction of it. There's an opening, but this is not the neck opening. It's just the opening to bring the finished edge or end of the scarf through and it snugly fits around a neck. This technique is not the first, this is not the first time I've shown this technique on Sewing with Nancy. With guest Gail Brown about three or four years ago, we showed this scarf. Since that time, so many of you have written to me that you have made this scarf and given it away to homeless shelters that I wanted to encourage the rest of you to do the same. So here are the ways that you can make a self-tying scarf for volunteerism or for your family. You'll need a half a yard of fabric cut into two 9-inch strips. And you're not going to use the full 60 inches, but rather 9 by 40, two strips that are 9 by 40. And let me straighten these out. And you'll notice that one end is narrower than the other, the 9 inches at one end, and tapering to 5 inches at the other end. And so we gradually just tapered it on both sides to an equal amount, so it equaled 5 inches. You'll use a ruler or a long yardstick to do this. After making those simple changes, simply sew together the back seam, the seam that will be at the center back of the short ends, just a half inch seam, a fourth of inch seam, you really don't have to measure, it's just a quick little seam allowance. Then after finger pressing open the seam, you notice I haven't pressed it all throughout this series, pressing would flatten the nap on the fleece, simply finger press and then measure from the seam eight inches. And at the 8-inch mark on both sides of the lengthwise seam and on both scarf shapes, put a clip a half of an inch deep. Then either using that basting tape that we sh I showed you earlier or just with pins, press under to the wrong side the half-inch seam allowance between the two nips. So you're going to be pressing under a total of 16 inches, and this will be the loop area that will be open. Then stitch, just simply top stitch, that area down into place. So on both sides you can see the top stitching. Very simple. You know also you could try two different colors if you're using leftover fleeces, perhaps red and black. That might work as well. Then meet right sides together, aligning the long edges and also the short edges and with a half inch seam allowance stitch around the edge. Again it's important that you would sew the same width as the finished neckline area. So in other words, start sewing right at this clean finished edge and sew all the way around the scarf. And this end, I have started to grade the seam allowances, trimming them unevenly to get rid of some of the bulk, angle cut clip right across that corner. Now you can turn this right side out and I'm going to use a turner to help turn that right side out. Just put the rounded end in first, clasp it closed, and invert the fabric on top of itself. And then you'll have to do the rest yourself. Just turn this right side out. And earlier in the program I was talking about rolling the seam allowances between the, your fingers. Roll that seam so it comes to the outer edge. And then do the top stitching all the way around using a fourth of an inch seam allowance with just a top stitch to finish it off. And there you have a great self-tying scarf. It's great to embellish accessories, fleece accessories, with appliques. But keep in mind, if you're using a licensed applique or a licensed logo as your applique, that it's for your own personal use. It's not to be sold. So keep that thought in mind. Here's a hint from Primdritz, the manufacturers of OmniGrid rulers. These precision laser-cut rulers give unmatched accuracy. They're made of heavy-duty clear acrylic and are perfect for rotary cutting any color fabric from light to dark. 
OmniGrid's exclusive double sight lines are printed on the underside of the ruler for greatest accuracy in contrasting black and yellow, enabling you to see the measurements you need. Notice the ease of measuring on this pink fabric as well as a dark print. In addition to the straight cutting lines, you'll find degree lines, 60, 45, and 30, allowing you to cut geometric shapes without the use of templates. I think you can see why I use OmniGrid rulers on TV and at home. Here's a hint from Amazing Designs by Great Notions. Sometimes a garment requires subtle embroidery due to the fabric weight or the delicate garment style, like this cotton piquet shell. Amazing Designs suggest looking at embroidery designs with a new eye. Look to see if you can eliminate some colors or elements to get a completely different look. The flowers on this shell are from the Amazing Designs Floral Collection No. 5, where they are shown in very large, vibrant flowers. By eliminating all the color except the outline, you have a look that's just right for this garment. At home and at my studio, I sew with Koala cabinets because of their perfect design. There's no waste of time in getting started. Because of the Koala soft touch airlift system, the machine quickly and gently raises to the perfect sewing position. The design allows me to sit directly in front of the needle in clear view of my work with no strain on my neck or back. And Koala has a place for all my favorite notions and supplies. I always feel more efficient and more motivated to do my best work when my space is organized. A perfect design, that's why I sew with Koala. Hi, I'm Nancy Zeman. Thank you for joining me. This is my third program on my series, Fleece in a Flash. I'm showing speedy projects that can easily be made with high loft fleeces such as polar fleece and Eskimo fleece. Let's start with the Harlequin scarf, a traditional diamond-shaped motif created in a truly novel way. Customary seaming is not needed or used since the fabric doesn't ravel. You'll be amazed at the ease of sewing. Discover the joy of sewing fleece next on Sewing with Nancy. During this program, I'm going to be showing you three unique accessories or projects to make, and they all use the same type of edge joining seam. On this harlequin shaped diamond and then this scarf, you can see that the seaming is on the right side, and it's also the same on the underside. There isn't a traditional seam allowance because these edges have been butt together and stitched with a decorative stitch or a zigzag stitch, making it very flat. And this is all possible because the fabric doesn't ravel. It's a really unique way of sewing. To make this scarf, you'll need about a third of a yard of one color and a half a yard of the more dominant color, and cutting from each color three, three and a half wide strips. The fabric is 60 inches, wide so you'll have three strips of in this instance cream that are three and a half by sixty and three strips of the dark green that are three and a half by sixty out of the fabric where you purchased a half a yard you'll need to cut one inch strips two one inch strips the other option is to cut the scarf fringe and the fringe is cut from a rectangle of fabric you'll need one for each end of the scarf and this is seven inches by fourteen seven by fourteen as always, we have the dimensions in the companion book that accompanies the series to fringe it. This is the fun part. We'd like to keep about an inch to an inch and a half not fringed, so I'm just going to wrap the non-fringed section to the underside of the board. And then I'm simply going to start at the end to my left and cut half inch strips and just cut along the edge. Just cut a half inch, let it separate, and I can start at the very edge of the board, and I will not cut or trim the part that has been tucked underneath. So cut that half inch strip, and it's just, let me tuck it under one more time, there we go, and it works so well. Now I'm going to show you how to sew together the strips, the six strips, to make it into a strata. I'm going to show you now how to strip piece these six strips of fabric together, but in a very unusual way. We're going to simply place or place on your table your strips, alternating colors. And we're going to sew the edges together, again, not overlapping the seams, but just butting the edges together. I'll show you the finished stitched strata, strata the term used for quilting to put layers together. We've used red thread to show some comparison and contrast. And the feather stitch used, part of the stitch goes into the white and the other part goes into the green. 
white green. The stitch is relatively close together to make it a secure seam. But notice it really doesn't matter which way is the right side and the wrong side because the seaming looks the same. The setup at your sewing machine is going to be this particular setup for the three projects I'm going to show you today. The feather stitch is what I'm going to use right now and I'll show you a little bit later using a zigzag stitch and working with an edge joining foot. This foot may be called different things and for different machines, but basically there is an appendage down the center of the foot that marks the foot in the center and you, we can butt a fabric on either side of that guide, allowing those strips to be very evenly stitched together, evenly seamed together. The setting at the sewing machine is basic, even tension, same color of thread in the bobbin as the top, using all-purpose thread in the bobbin and the top. And then you can place two strips, alternating colors, next to each other on the, on the bed of your sewing machine. But before you start to sew, here's a hint. Do a little pull check. See which way the strips curl. They curl to the wrong side, so I'm going to sew with the right side up. And the, yes, this one is curling to the, in the same direction. Then simply butt or meet the strips together and then anchor the foot over the seam and stitch. And as I mentioned, I plugged in a decorative feather stitch. You can try different examples of stitches. This is not speedy sewing, not difficult either, but it takes a little time. You don't want to stretch the fabrics, just gently hold them into place and carefully stitch. There really isn't any pressing because there isn't a seam to press open. And also, you don't want to press fleece. You just want to steam it and flatten it with your hand. You can see how easy this is. Now, if you didn't have a decorative stitch on your machine and you'd like to seam fleeces with this edge joining seam, I'm going to try with a zigzag stitch. And I have found that I need to widen the width because it has to go between the different strips and shorten the length just a little bit. So I did the widest width and a length of about 1.0 millimeters. Otherwise the sewing is the same. You'd sew all strips together using this technique. In a few minutes I'll just show you the difference between these two strips. After doing the sewing, then I'll show you how to recut the strips to make the harlequin type of diamond shape. The top portion shows the feather stitch, half of it in the white, the other half in the forest green color. And then the lower portion shows the zigzag. Works equally as well. So after seaming all strips together, I'll show you how to cut it. To create the diamond pattern, I'm going to cross cut the strata of the fleece. I steamed, not pressed, but steamed the fleece and patted it so it was nice and even and flat. And now to cross cut it, I'm simply going to use the 60 degree line on my ruler and align it along one lengthwise edge. And at the same time, making certain that the bias line or the diagonal line intersects at the very tip of the strata. And after you have those two points aligned, cut. We're going to be cutting eight strips. The strips are going to be three and a half inches wide. So again, we'll use that 60 inch line across the top. Make certain that it's lined up because it's just a little skew off. It will be difficult to get these diamonds to match. And then the three and a half inch mark all the way down. Double check and then cut. And you'll be cutting eight of these strips. Let me do one more for you so that you can get the idea of just aligning the 60 inch degree mark and the three and a half inch strip and cut again. Eight strips you'll be cutting in all. We're not going to have any waste, believe it or not, with working with the diamond strips to make a scarf. We're going to use every inch of the fleece. And to accommodate that, I'm going to ask you to butt the, t the strip together to create a circle, meeting together the angle edges. And, z and use your stitch, the feather or zigzag stitch, as you can see here, to sew this into a tube. Sewing it into a tube, then, requires you to cut it apart. This may seem unusual step, but it really saves time and gives you great accuracy. Choose one of the white diamond shapes or the light diamond shape color and place your ruler from point to point, it's in a tube now, from point to point and cut down the center. You'll do this eight times and then you'll have the perfect ends shaped. You'll do this to all eight. 
areas. By the way, you need to create this. If you want to make it longer or shorter, you'll need an even number to make this technique, and I'll show you why in a minute. Then simply lay out these strips that are all identical, meeting edge to edge. And you can see, here's the strip. And I just simply, when you meet it together, aligning the edge, and I have a little tape put together. And then you would stitch all of these edges together using your feather stitch or zigzag before you reach the tape, remove the tape. Now what happens, as you can see, when you put these diamond shapes together, both ends are at a severe angle. Rather than having all the waste, assuming that all the seaming had been done, I'm going to save a little time by just asking you to envision that being stitched, bring one end up to meet the other, and meet these two unsewn edges, edges as you can see here, and stitch together. Then you have one very large tube to work with. Here's another color combination using this Harlequin diamond shape. And after you've sewn it into a tube, cut apart one area. And then you have your scarf. Add the fringe to the lower edge, as well as the one inch side strips using that same stitch technique. And in a little bit of time, you'll have your scarf completed in a very elegant Harlequin style. You can purchase Argyle sweaters, Argyle socks, and now you can create an Argyle Christmas stocking. If you look closely, this stocking has the same unique design as the scarf we just made, with the addition of the Argyle characteristic of a gold line or stitching that intersects the diamond shapes. Add a funky fringe, cuff, and you're ready for Santa's treats. I'd like to show you the fabric that we just created as part of the scarf sample using the red and the green diamond motifs. And the difference between this motif and the finished argyle stocking is just this line that's stitched through the diamond shapes. So you can create the fabric as I just detailed for this harlequin scarf and then add the little interesting stitching if you'd like. I'm going to be using a decorative stitch you can choose a stitch of your choice. It's going to be kind of an overlock type of stitch, as I'll show you on the sample. And because of the argyle style, we're going to choose a rayon thread, both in the bobbin and the top, that would go right down the center of each of the diamond blocks. The foot can be a traditional embroidery foot, because we're using an embroidery stitch. Or if you did not have embroidery stitches, work with a zigzag stitch. To get even spacing, you'll need to use some kind of guide, and I'm going to use the quilting bar. The quilting bar attaches on my machine at the top shank area of my foot, and it still is in the sliding position. I'm going to kind of find the center of my diamond block and position the bar right there. And then I'm going to tighten that screw so that it stays right in that position. Remember that screw can be kind of small, and I've taken it out of my machine by mistake, so just remember that little phrase, righty tighty, lefty loosey, for working with uh, tightening that screw. Now, I would like to ask you to test this on your machine at home to make certain that you have the right length and the right width of this machine. Notice I'm just going to guide that bar along the previously sewn seam and just stitch down the center. You may find that you may want to lengthen the stitch a little bit in case you get too much of a pucker of the seam. Easy, simple stitching. Just stitch down all of those diamonds. After you've taken about, oh, 15, 20 minutes to do the stitching, fold the fabric in half, meeting, it doesn't matter, meeting either right or wrong sides, and stack the argyles so that they're even. And then using the pattern in the booklet, just cut out the shape of the stocking. The cuff of the stocking, that fringe cuff is cut four inches by 15 and a half. You can sew it together into a tube and do the fringing as we did earlier. To sew it to the cuff, after you've, after you've stitched the two stockings meeting right sides and you've turned it right side out, then simply meet, now this is a little different, meet the right side of the cuff to the wrong side of the stocking stitch. When you turn this right side out, you have a really up-to-date stocking that Santa will appreciate filling. 
If you're the kind of person who doesn't like to follow the crowd, the freestyle fleece blanket is a technique you must try. Create contemporary quilt blocks by stacking and freestyle cutting three different fleece colors. Then, rearrange the blocks into a one-of-a-kind arrangement. The edge joining seam techniques puts the puzzle-like pieces together. Here's how. The blanket that we just showed you was made out of 12 different blocks, the freestyle blocks. And it measures approximately 52 by 62 inches, give or take a few inches. So you can get the approximate size. Choose your three favorite colors or colors of fleece you'd like to put together. You'll need 7 eighths of a yard of one color, 5 eighths of a second, and 3 eighths of a third. After you have purchased your fabric, stack it. And this would be a great time to work with a friend. Stack the three layers of fabric together and cut four different blocks using a ruler that's 12 and a half inches square or simply cut a template that's 12 and a half inches square. And it's good to use a friend because you're working with big squares of fabric and maybe someone can help. One person can cut while the other person holds the ruler very secure. I've already cut three different pastel colors of fleece and then you're going to freeform cut. This is really determines, you can determine the style, but make sure your fabrics are stacked. And with a 60 millimeter rule, with a, excuse me, 60 millimeter cutter, cut through all the layers, and then, I'll cut through one more time, and then simply cut another time. And you can see the cuts. This is totally up to you how you'd like to make the cuts. Then we're going to rearrange these fabrics, choosing one section from each area and we'll see how this works. It's kind of a fun way of putting something together. Oh, this one has to stay here. And I bet we have to just move these around. As I said, it's like a puzzle. Then after you have stacked your three designs, then you're going to do some stitching. I have several other color combinations below my quilt. And you can see the color combination of a camel color. This is a darker green and a navy. And to create this together, I simply put the last cut, the, the two sections together, and then the curved area. Now, I've started to sew this together. To work with this, if you're working with these little ends that are, you'd like to match perfectly, I used a small little scrap of water-soluble stabilizer, just moistened the end, and attached it to the fabric. This allowed me to sew onto that little stabilizer, which you could remove later, and then put a stabilizer at the end to make certain that those edges come out perfectly. Then after sewing those two strips together using that edge joining seam, then simply butt the remaining piece into place. If you'd like to work with two fabrics instead of three, you certainly can do that. This smaller square shows a red and black combination. We just stack the two fabrics and stitch them together. And you can see that unique arrangement. And the good thing about this is that you can turn this and shape it any way you'd like to get unique designs. You'll be making 12 squares. So you'll be cutting four, as I mentioned, four stacks of your fabric and then cutting them. And if you'd like to have the same kind of look once you put it together, you may want to kind of make a template to cut the remaining three stacks. But you can see the arrangement that you make is totally up to you. We'll look back at our remaining blanket or our completed blanket just to show you what you're going to do with the extra fabric. Remember you needed seven eighths, five eighths, and three eighths? Well, the remaining fabrics, you'll need to cut one inch wide strips of one of the colors, one and a half of the second color that was five eighths of a yard, and then four inch strips, four four inch strips from the seven eighths of a yard purchase. Just the way we assembled the scarf, you assemble the 12 blocks, then add the borders all the way around. You can leave the edge unfinished, or if you'd like, you can turn under the edge. It's totally up to you. This is a free form blanket made of fleece. It's really fleece decorating in a flash. <music>
try some of these options of creating a fleece. It's fun and it's fast. Visit Nancy's website at www.sewingwithnancy.com for more information on this program. Sewing with Nancy has been made possible by grants from the following companies. FOP, simply the best European line of sewing machines. Ginger Incorporated, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears. Madeira, because creativity is never black and white. Prim Dritz, the source for sewing and quilting notions. Amazing designs by Great Notions, your one source for home embroidery. Koala cabinets designed with maximum storage using minimum space. And Nancy's Notions catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and notions.